Well, good morning, everybody. It's uh, Jim Hodson again at the Fort Worth Aviation Museum, home of the most touchable warbirds in Texas. It is May 23rd, 2020, and we're here for an update on the YF-16 and on the, uh, the TA-4. I have uh, Bill Morris with us today, and he's going to give us some, uh, some of his thoughts on the update on the airplane so far. And then uh, Gary Goff is also here, and he's going to talk about uh, fighting the airplane. So, uh, Bill... Uh, why don't you tell people what we've been up to the last uh, the last bit of time here? Well, for the last two months, we've been doing absolutely nothing on the airplane. But what we have been using the time for is a lot of research, uh, going through uh, people going through the archives uh, at Lockheed Martin, uh, formerly General Dynamics stuff, looking for uh, any design drawings information that we have. Uh, on this particular airframe. There's only two built. This is uh, YF-16 number two. Um, the contours and the configuration of the airplane are significantly different uh, in several areas from uh, the production airplanes that everybody's used to today. Uh, one of the features... Yeah, let's go and talk to because it's about the nose, right? Yeah, one of the big features we talked about this the last time was the nose contour. This is the radar bulkhead which is on a production airplane. These were the mounts for uh, the radar antenna um, and you can see it's substantially larger. This is the original contour of the nose section of the YF. It had no radar. It had a uh, essentially a, a sensor to use for uh, air-to-air air uh, gunnery and that was it. So on the production airplanes of course this whole nose section got heavily modified. What we're working on now is with the contour drawings that we found uh, for these, this particular airframe all the way out to the tip of the nose. So ultimately, we're hoping to have a nose cone on here that looks a lot like it did when it was a prototype, right? It, it, yeah, the, the idea is to take the original drawings, uh, contour drawings, and recreate, build a new radar for the aircraft all the way back to that one hit. Okay. Uh, so that we have for real replica okay. the nose configuration on the airplane. Well, we talked to people last time about uh, the 10-inch plug in the, in the fuselage that we want to take out mm -hmm. and uh, that we're uh, trying to locate pieces for the landing gear so we can have landing gear, which it doesn't have right now. Uh, and then we're also going to need to have landing gear doors and those kinds of things. So I know you've got some searches going on for that type of stuff yeah, right we've, now. Yeah, uh, we've made some contacts with uh, uh, both the Air Force Museum depot for these aircraft is at uh, Ogden Air Logistics Center and then also the uh, uh, the boneyard at Tucson uh, they have apparently been instructed to uh, reclaim all of the existing the remaining F-16 A's and B's which is basically convert them back into scrap metal okay uh, and uh, we're trying to get something that will uh, enable us to have one of those by some means, because we can use it uh, for parts. Uh, the engine inlet you can see is uh, looks like Swiss cheese, because that was after 40 years of testing various antenna systems. You're talking about all these holes here yeah, on the side, right? That, and then up here by the cockpit, 
it was a number of mods made over its 40 years. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, that the inlet between the prototype and the first production airplanes did not change, so obviously we could replace the skin panels um, instead of having to go fill them with some sort of putty and then have to worry about the plugs coming out or something. Okay, good. Well, Bill, I appreciate you uh, updating for us here today because uh, we've got a lot of people who are interested in this and how it's going. And hopefully, uh, we'll start to be able to get back to work on some of this and start to see some uh, some changes being made with it. But uh, thanks for being with us today. Now, we have Gary Goff with us again today. Uh, and uh, Gary's going to talk to you about uh, his experiences at uh, uh, fighting the F-16. We talked with him earlier about his experiences with the uh, the F-18 and the F-15. So, uh, Gary, why don't you tell, tell people a little bit about your experiences with fighting the F-16. When the F-16 came out, these were our arch rivals, obviously, 15-16. The F-16 guys called us the Flying Tennis Court because the F-15 was so big, or Rodan, if you're familiar with Godzilla, big flying monster. We called this thing the Lawn Dart because when it first came out, the A models, every once in a while the, the computer would burp and the aircraft would pitch over and hit the ground if you're flying low levels. Kind of tough to survive that. But anyway, a uh, wicked sense of humor, I guess. And the nice thing about it, when I got to fly against them, I flew against the A models, which had um, a, an AOA limiter. If you remember our discussion on the F-18, we talked about angle of attack and how you could get slow and still have excellent nose authority and how much better the F-18 in its nose authority at slow speed fight was for, uh, compared to the F-15. Well, when we first fought the F-16s, we were told that they had an AOA limiter of about 180 knots, somewhere around there. So the first thing we did with an F-16 when we turned with it was get slow so that we could beat them. Uh, when uh, Masawa, which is in northern Japan, converted to the F-16C models, they had what we call a gold canopy and a big lip. He talked about the intake on this airplane. The intake on the 16s was much bigger and the engine was much bigger. And when that happened, uh, it was a game changer. Let's just say that they didn't have any problems fighting slow. They didn't have any problems fighting high. And um, we had met our match like we had done with the uh, F-18s. And the thing that we are so livid about against the F-16s is their computer software for the heat-seeking missiles that both of us carried the exact same missile, their software gave them a shoot cue a half a mile before us. That's just not fair. <laughs> the cheaters, F-16s are cheaters. So somebody just asked about what uh, the paint scheme is gonna be when we uh, get this restored. It's gonna go back into the red, white, and blue. Uh, that it uh, awesome that it, uh, it it wore as a as a prototype. Uh, it originally was in kind of a baby blue and cream, cream color, which is actually pretty interesting too. But uh, yeah, we can still see some of that on the side of the airplane. We'll see if we can get around here and see some of that. But uh, our intent is to uh, to put it back in the uh, in the red, white, and blue. That uh, that this airplane looks so good. You can still see uh, you can see some of the blue right up here. Yeah, there was some of the uh, some of the blue and some of the cream. Uh, we've got some some other little vestiges of, of red up here too, but this is all going to be red, white, and blue. So, uh, let's see. Uh, hi, hi, Diane. Uh, nice to see some of the same people back here with us today. Uh, we're going to uh, go back and, and talk about. Have you got anything else you want to mention on the F-16, Gary, in terms of uh, fighting it? Um, I tell you what. When uh, these things first flew, and the pilots were talking about uh, instantaneous, I mean, no delay whatsoever. As soon as they pulled the stick back, they're doing nine Gs. That's nine times the force of gravity. So if you're weighing 200 pounds in the seat, at nine times the force of gravity, you're now 1,800 pounds in the seat. And this airplane would instantaneously go to nine times the force of gravity. You know, you got to respect the guys that flew these airplanes. Uh, even though that this is not the first aircraft to have a side-mounted stick, because we learned about that on the F-102, this is the aircraft that perfected side sticks. This is the aircraft that everything else nowadays is based upon because of the technology that the F-16 had in it and its fly-by-wire design. 
Let's talk about that side stick for just a second. Uh, it's my understanding that when the airplane first came out, the stick didn't move. Uh, it was what we told, uh, again, talking to the F-16 guys, it was just a pressure sensor. So you just put a little pressure on it and, and the airplane would do something. Well, as a pilot, all of us had ever flown before this thing was hydraulically flown actuated aircraft. So the stick moved just like you would a civilian airplane. It moved a lot. So you could, you could tell the feel and, and get an idea what the airplane's doing it as you move the stick. On this airplane, that did not happen. And so it was very difficult for pilots to transition. So am I right, Bill, I think they added like a quarter of an inch movement or something like that. Yeah, just to give you the feel. Just to give you the feel. And you imagine a quarter of an inch flexion. That's it. Whereas in my F-15, I could move it a good two feet in oh. all directions. Wiping Same way the, the cockpit. Right. Wiping Same with the F-4. The but this thing... The technology revolutionized when the F-16 came out. Well, now, did the seat move? Did the, did the seat move under G? No. I understood that that was original part of the original design is that the seat would tilt or move with the, with the G force so you get more of a transverse. But it was canted further back yeah, than okay. ours. Was ours was more degrees, upright. Y'all's was, back. was okay. back to help, help you kind sustain, to sustain okay. the Gs better. Okay. And the other thing is interesting is you notice that the canopy and the front part of the canopy, there's nothing there. It's completely canopy. So when you come up to tank to refuel on the aircraft, in the early days, it was like they're trying to figure out where the position is because you have no relative movement. So some of the guys would take post-it notes, <laughs> I'm not kidding, and they'd stick it to the canopy so that they could see the relative movement on the tanker so they could stay in the refueling position. Well, Obviously, after a while, everybody got used to it. Well, we've talked about that a little bit on formation flying, that you've got markers on the airplane yes, where you're setting yourself up. And so... I know from formation flying, uh, we always refer to it as the bug on the canopy method for, for having your rendezvous point. So you would put an airplane at the, at the place where the canopy rail joined the canopy mm -hmm. arch. Mm -hmm. but, uh, so you had these different markers or landmarks within the cockpit that you used to fly off of. But this one didn't have anything. So it would, uh, I can see where that would make it a yeah, little it was bit more difficult. Same thing in the Eagle. We had the exact, because it was built by McDonnell Douglas that built the F-4. So we had the same concept. But this thing whole different way of flying airplanes okay uh let's see does anybody have any questions about the uh, the f-16 before we move on to the ta4 uh, we're going to try to make up for the uh the flippy a ta4 video from a few <laughs> weeks ago uh i've got a little bit of stability here today but uh this thing has still been acting i got up. a question rumor has it that the original design for the f-16 was to be a day uh interceptor fighter that's right and that it wasn't until the Air Force started adding everything to it and hanging the kitchen sink on it. But the original design, because it just had two heat-seeking missiles out on the on the wing. No, it actually had, uh, on the prototype on this one, they had two uh, tanks for, uh, two mounts for uh, uh, external fuel tanks. And then, of course, all the F-16s flew with the uh, AIM-9 missiles. Right, that's what we were carrying. Yeah. Lima's and, and Mike's. And then uh, under the wing, they were stations for two more. Right. So it was basically, the airplane was uh, considered a lightweight fighter. Okay. Uh, it was uh, the idea of get up quick, shoot down the bad guys. Oh, yeah, it could get up, up quick. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and it was only after, in fact, the original concept for the F-16 was that, uh, that there would be uh, about 70% of their missions would be air-to-air, -air, and then 30% of the time they would be carrying ordnance. And then it, it actually ended up flipping. And they then, were like yeah, more 70% air-to-mud. More 70% yeah. uh, air-to-ground. Now, that would be fun as a day VFR fighter go up and shoot somebody. Yeah. That would be a heck of an airplane to fly. We just had a question about the tail number on this. This is the uh, the, the prototype number two. And, uh, Bill, what's the number on this airplane? Uh, it's an 8. 72-01568. 7201568. So that's the actual tail number on this airplane, and it is prototype number two. Because the first one ended in seven, right? Yeah. 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 So, um, okay. Bill, we'd like to thank you for being with us here Thanks, again Bill. and jumping in, okay. and uh, we're going to go talk about the TA4 now. Okay. It's still thank a lawn dart, though, Bill. <laughs> the right. Eagle still is better. The sky peak. <laughs> Sky pig, okay. I love You're going to always hear that. <laughs> You're always going to hear that kind of stuff. I show. love it. Okay. So now we're going to switch gears here and we're going to talk about the TA-4. Now we did the A-4 uh, last week, uh, but we've got an opportunity to go back and, and, uh, and do a, a redo on, uh, on this airplane. So 
this airplane came to us in the in the uh, tan and brown camouflage, which this airplane actually never served in. This airplane was a, a training command airplane. Uh, the TA-4 Skyhawk had spent a lot of time in Meridian, and then it also spent some time in, uh, in NAS Kingsville, in Kingsville, Texas. I've got about 700 hours in these as an advanced jet instructor and also as a student. So uh, we're going to, we've talked about the A-4 a lot, but we've got some things here to show you. So uh, we talked about the slats, and I think the slats move on this one. So Gary, if you want to see if you can get the slat to move. Oh. Got to be stronger than the average. Yeah, barrel. so you can you can see these are these obviously are not greased up for flight, but it's an aerodynamic slat. There's no hydraulics, so it's just air pressure that pushes uh, pushes these up and, and lets it come down. Uh, the the color scheme that we plan to use on this airplane is uh, is white and international orange. It's going to be a training command scheme because that's what this airplane served in. Uh, I think a few of the things that uh, are different about the TA4J. In addition to the fact that it's got a second cockpit, uh, which means it was used for a number of different things. If I can get my thumb to do what I want it to do here on the, <laughs> on the gimbal. Uh, two cockpits. And so this airplane was used as a trainer. Sometimes a student would be in the front. Sometimes they'd be in the back. But uh, also in the, uh, out in the fleet, in tactical squadrons, uh, this airplane was used as a fastback forward air controller. Uh, and it was uh, used in Vietnam that way. It was... Uh, uh, the Marine Corps started the uh, the fastback program with uh, TF9s, uh, and then after a period of time, uh, they went to the uh, the TA4s, and it was about the time that the Air Force started uh, the fastback program with the Misties. Now, you may have remembered or not from the uh, uh, from the other day, we looked at the uh, the A4 Charlie that we have up front. And its intake is flat against the fuselage. Well, this is a later model, and they found that they could get better airflow into the engine by, uh, by separating the, uh, the intake. Uh, the long probe here, we talked about that before, that that is uh, that's the refueling probe. It's not a pull-up bar. We've had some people out here that thought that <laughs> yes, was the case. Not a exactly. It's not a pull-up bar. <laughs> and uh, we did talk about and showed you the rat last, uh, last week. And, uh, and this rat isn't closed, so this is what the compartment looks like when the rat is closed. And again, if you need it, you can pull it. This airplane also had what's referred to as manual reversion. So if you needed to, uh, you could, uh, if you had hydraulic problems, uh, you could pull a handle and go to a manual control or reversion, manual reversion on the airplane and fly it manually without any kind of hydraulic boost. I can tell you that that was a chore. Oh, yes. It was really very difficult to be able to do that. Uh, yeah, jets are designed to fly with hydraulics. Yeah, and the pressure on the uh, on the airframe was quite a bit. I can I can tell you that when uh, uh, I was going through as a as an advanced jet instructor in Kingsville in the uh, uh, in the mid 70s, and uh, one of the things that new instructors had to do was to go out and do a manual reversion with them and see if they could actually have the physical strength to do that. And, the same time that women were coming into the role as pilots in the military, and that was one of the things they did. Uh, they did with all of the female pilots who were candidates uh, was with this airplane was to see if they could fly it with manual reversion, and if they they couldn't, then they would go to transports. Uh, sometimes in that kind of case. So, the airplane now has been pretty well prepped. Uh, Kevin Nelson, one of our uh, one of our restoration people was out here today doing some more sanding on it. You can see some of the white underneath the, uh, the, the, uh, the tan and the brown. And so we're getting pretty close to the point in time when we, uh, we're going to go ahead and put this in white and orange. Now, Gary, you mentioned the other day, but since we're talking about fighting airplanes, tell us about flight, fighting the A-4 again. The A-4 is uh, uh, just phenomenal aircraft in the turning capability. Uh, their roll rates and their turn was very tight and they were sustainable. In other words, they didn't have to descend to keep turning. They could keep high G on the aircraft and keep turning. And uh, the only experience I have with the A-4s was the Marine Corps Top Gun instructors. And we had no idea how many of them were coming. And that, you can't have a better simulation of combat than to have absolutely no idea how many of them were coming. And uh, they would fly in very, very tight parade formation so that the radar couldn't break out and we didn't know how to get and when they split up 
it was a surprise to say the least. And if you stayed and turned with an A4, you're gonna they were gonna shoot you. You had to explode in the vertical to beat an A4. The roll rate was 720 degrees, and my gosh, what a great airplane. We call them scooters because they would yeah. scoot around so fast. Well, and you really wore this airplane because I. Uh, Anybody who was over, I, I can't remember what the height restriction was, but if you were over about 6'1 or 6'2, uh, you yeah, had I trouble getting in, in the cockpit yeah. on this. Uh, I would get in it, and I'm not a big guy. I'm, I was 5'10 now, or then. Uh, and you would sit in, you'd roll your shoulders forward, you'd close the canopy down, and then you'd press fit yourself back up into wow. the canopy, and you actually wore the airplane. Uh, it was uh, it was an amazing airplane to fly. And uh, you had to know where all those switches were and everything because you couldn't hardly look down and see a lot of them along the side side panels of the airplane. It was never designed to be a fighter, although uh, the Singapore, uh, I believe it was the Singapore Navy used them as, uh, as fighter or interceptors. It was used in the Navy and the Marine Corps pretty much uh, totally as a, as a ground attack. So uh, uh, we've got one other point that I'm going to bring up. Uh, we talked about it uh, earlier with Bill on the YF-16 and what was doing, and Kevin Renshaw on what he's doing with trying to mate up uh, a new nose cone. We did a separate video of that this morning, and we'll be uploading that onto the uh, onto our Facebook page. And then we've got some news for you too. We are doing a soft opening here today. That sounds like a real jet. There are two F or F-18s overhead. Okay, well I'm not going to try to targets. Do that. They're I'll, targets. I'll Shoot them. Down. Shoot them. They're targets. No, they're F-16s. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Two's engaged. Yep, they are okay. Uh, if, I wish I could show them to you. They're in with uh, they're in pretty much into a combat spread right now. Ah, oh, the sound of freedom. So we'll get back to this. Uh, one of the things we're doing here today is uh, what we refer to as a soft opening. Uh, we've got a few people out to test our procedures for uh, doing an air park only uh, visits here at the museum. And that appears to be working out pretty well. Uh, we're also trying to uh, install our point of sale system. But what this all means to uh, everybody watching is we are going to open back up to the public next week on Saturday the 30th and on the 31st. Uh, we will be open from, uh, from 9 a.m. until 1 p.m. Uh, we're going to encourage you to uh, buy your tickets online. And you can do that uh, through our website at uh, Fort Worth Aviation Museum. there it'll just make uh, the process easier here and uh, so we're looking forward to having uh, having folks back uh, we've got some procedures in place so that we can all enjoy the airplanes and be inside and uh, we're hoping to see you soon now we are going to continue uh, these walk arounds and uh, and interviews with uh, with pilots and crew members uh, for now we hope you have a good Memorial Day weekend Keep an eye out for the video with uh, Kevin Renshaw about uh, mating up the uh, mating up the nose on the YF-16. And uh, let's see, Gary, you got anything else you'd like to tell people? No, sir. Thank you very much. Okay. So uh, this is Jim Hodson and Gary Goff from the Fort Worth Aviation Museum, home to the most touchable warbirds in Texas. Stay safe, and uh, hopefully we'll start to see you next week. Thanks. Bye.